I'm Khalil Spear, power forward at Robert Morris University, and you're listening to The Tool Shed on Colonial Sports Network. Welcome back to another episode of The Tool Shed. I'm Ethan Morrison alongside Tyler Gallo, and today we have a very special guest here on the podcast. Tristan Freeman is with us. He is a writer for Busting Brackets along with Fan Sided as well. So, Tristan, thank you so much for coming on and helping us preview the season. Yeah, thank you for having me. I'm excited for just a week away for the season. Can't wait to watch Robert Morris and the rest of D1 basketball. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we want to start off, first off, going, you know, the preseason polls came out, um, I think, two weeks ago now. So, I mean, I want to get your guys' initial thoughts on, you know, what we saw. I think Robert Morris was – plays 10th in that preseason yeah. poll. Um, I mean, Tyler, I'll start off with you. What, I mean, what are your thoughts, initial thoughts coming into the season? So we talked about it on our last one that we recorded, um, and we said that it's just a lot of undervaluing is going on with the Colonials. And, you know, like as, as John Rothstein would say, you got to buy a stock now on this team because this is a team that's definitely on the rise. And we've seen, you know, I mean, looking at some of the players that they brought in and looking at how they could potentially gel together is really important for how this team is going to have success this season. And I think that – Anywhere in the middle of the pack is perfect for them. I don't think tenth. I think tenth is a bit of a disservice to this team. Tristan, same to you. Yeah, I, I think there's a clear divide between the top half and the bottom half of the Horizon League. You have teams like Cleveland State, Wright State, uh, Detroit, Milwaukee. They're the consensus top four or five teams. But anywhere else, besides the preseason polls, you have other uh, media outlets doing uh, their polls at Horizon League. Anywhere between, if you exclude Green Bay and IUPUI, who's the clear bottom two. 10 through 7 is a is, is a complete crapshoot. Mm -hmm. I think you have teams, you know, Robert Morris, they bring in a ton of new talent, clear up the roster, but how good are they going to be? I think there's going to be some cl some questions they'll have to answer about can they compete in Horizon League on a consistent basis. I think them and Purdue Fort Wayne as well, who's in a similar boat. It, there's just – it's hard to tell what this roster is going to do there's a lot of trust in Coach Andy Tool. I think he has a lot of respect from national media. But, you know, again, with the, with the clear divide, it's hard to tell what RMU is going to do until we see them, until we see his pieces come together on the court. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, I, I thought the same thing when I was going through and previewing these teams, and I'm still going through, like, you know, the final three next week. But when I was looking at it, I'm like, yeah, you're right. Like we were saying, like 10 through 7, there's – there's not much. It can be decided by, you know, a couple of games here and there, a couple of shots. And, you know, like 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 we said, I mean, when you look at this team, they're, they've they added so much talent, it's all about are they going to gel together. Now, only four players have returned from last year's squad. You got now ten new faces, I think, that have all came in here, all from different areas of the country, all from different schools, different levels. Um, you know, so Tristan, I want to start off with you. I mean, what are your thoughts on the talent that they added? I mean, we saw last year you got a little, a little bit of a smaller lineup. I mean, looks like what they competed with in the NEC, um, and now this year compared to what compared to this in last year. I mean, what are what are the di differences that you've seen? You know, on how Andy Tool, you know, built up his roster. Yeah, I think Coach Tool said himself multiple outlets that they were just way too small for Horizon League. I, I saw someone credit to Three Man Weave for this one. I saw from they had a one of the twenty smallest rosters in the country. You can get away with that in North in the Northeast, but in Horizon League that has a ton of size up and down. You, you could tell how that played out last season. It was just miserable for them. There's there's two sides for all the newcomers. You have the guards that has proven production. Michael Green was one of the top players in Northeast, a 16-point-per-game score. Rasheem Dunn was a two-year starter at St. John's, so you know what they can do. In the front court, to join Khalil Spears, there's just a lot of potential. You know, a lot of these guys average about four or five points at the previous spots, a lot of size, a lot of toughness, a lot of depth now this year. But which among them is going to stand out and become the clear go-to guys in the front court, that's going to answer a lot of questions because you can have as much size as possible, but if these guys are only averaging four or five points a game in Horizon League and are struggling defensively, then it doesn't matter much. Mm -hmm. Tyler, I mean, what, what are your thoughts on, you know, how – and the tool has been able to build up his roster. So obviously the, you know, on paper, the team looks great with all the schools they've come from, but like so many people have said, and like Tristan just said, I mean, it's all about how they can play consistently um, and how they can slot in. You know, we know how the 
talent that Justin Winston brings in from St. Bonaventure. I believe he averaged nine points in his rookie season, mm-hmm. if I'm remembering correctly. You know, obviously, Farron Flavors has had success at the collegiate level before, but then really saw a dip in production when he got to the bigger school in Oklahoma State. So it's really, like, like I said before, it's a mysterious team coming into this year. But I do think that if anyone's going to get a team like this to buy in, it's Andy Toole. Mm-hmm. And, I mean, you, you know, you see – you know, who they've been able to bring in. They, they brought in some more size, a lot more size. A lot of other outlets are saying, oh, they're undersized still. They're going to be running three guards. I don't really think we're going to see them. You know, you're going to see them run three guards. I mean, sometimes I don't think it's going to be an every game occurrence just because you're going to need to match up with that size, you know, play more of the big men. I mean, you got guys that can shoot from the outside. Justin Winston's a very good outside shooter. Matteo Kunto is able to hit hit it from the outside as well. Even Brandon Stone, who's a, who's a center, is able to hit from the outside at a pretty decent clip, I think around like 25% that he hit in La, at LaSalle. So, you know, combining that with, you know, the guard play that they have, you, you mentioned Ferran Flav- Farron Flavors and Rasheem Dunn, all of those guys, being able to, you know, compliment those guys as well, and along with that veteran presence, is going to be looking very good for this team this year and, you know, is going to be able to surprise a lot of teams. Um, so, you know, going in, into taking a look at the schedule, they have a gauntlet to start the year, going up against Central Florida to start the year on November 10th. Then they travel to Lexington, Lexington, Kentucky on November 12th. This is the first game that I'm really going to be looking at for them. I mean, we know, I mean, I've seen this team, I've watched this team over the, over the past couple of years, and it's always them starting off slow, not able to find their, like, footing as much early on. But, you know, you got a great opportunity to, you know, test your guys out. This is a good test for them, especially going up against some bigger schools like UCF and um, Kentucky. And then after that is Ohio as well. So, I mean, those first three games, what are your guys' thoughts on those? And, you know, what is Robert Morris? They might not necessarily win all three of those, but what's going to be a good uh, factor and what's gonna, what are you going to be looking at in terms of, you know, what we're going to see from this team the rest of the year. So I think, that, like you said, they, they often start slow. I mean, it's, there's no question about that. We've seen it the past four years, four years that I've been here. Um, it's perfect for them. I think it's a way to get their feet under them against some of the top-tier teams, like especially Kentucky. I mean, we'll be there. We'll see you watching that game. That'll be awesome to watch. But that MTE is going to be really important for them because they've got three games in the span of a week, and it's going to really test how they can bounce back after a tough loss. Like maybe they get – Boat race by Kentucky in that game. They come back against Ohio, put up a good performance. You don't really know what's going to happen, but that is perfect for them. And then starting off the season against a pretty, you know, mid-tier solid team in, in uh, Central Florida is going to be good for them, I think. Yeah, I, I think the Central Florida game is going to be a complete contrast in a team in UCF that returns everybody from last year. They're going to have a whole – their chemistry is going to be fine. There's nothing to worry about for them versus Robert Morris, who's going to have a bunch of guys playing together effectively for the first time. So, the, the you know, the good news is these are this is a very old Robert Morris team. You have a couple of fifth-year guys and, and done in flavors that's going to be used to this kind of scenario. And then, you know, Kentucky, you know, a whole bunch of new pieces, but this is also a team that's going to be on a revenge tour. They had nine wins. They were a complete laughing stock in the national media. They're going to come out and they're going to want to dominate every team that – that on paper is inferior to them as possible. So this is going to be a scenario where the Colonials are going to have to come together soon or else they're going to have a a rough record headed into to Horizon League play. But they're, but I I trust Coach Tool that he's going to have them ready. I think there's a lot of talent and experience that they're, they're going to be a fairly competitive team. And this team also has a lot to prove themselves after what happened last year. So... It's going to be a good situation to get a lot of experience and growth and head into January, which is what really matters for the program. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that Ohio team went to the tournament last year. And, you know, right after them is Mount St. Mary's. So renewing that old NEC rivalry is something that, you know, I was looking to see if they were going to do something with that. I mean, I know St. Francis later on the schedule where they said, I think last year, that they were going to continue that series with them past this season. So you got that NEC rivalry, November 19th, the home opener. I think that's their first real test. If they can, you know, sh- put up a strong so- showing against Mount St. Mary's and, you know, if they're able to get production f- from guys, that, you know, and able to use that depth that they have, um, I think that's going to be one of their big first tests for them in this non-conference, uh, non-conference race. Um, and then right after that, uh, on November 27th, they play against Davidson down in North Carolina. That's another game where it's a pretty good high major school in Davidson. Uh, they're one of the, I think they're one of the top mid-major or mid-major teams in the country. 
So, I mean, another one of those games where, you know, it's going to be tough for Robert Morris to, you know, be able to win that game. But, you know, looking at, you know, if they're able to get production, like I said earlier, against like a Kentucky team, able to get production from guys, I think that's going to be uh, a really good game for them to, you know, kind of have an opportunity to, to grow. Um, and then, obviously, I mean, what are your guys' thoughts? I mean, right after that game, December 2nd, the first Horizon League matchup of the year. What are your guys' thoughts about, you know, putting sticking Horizon League games, you know, earlier in the non-conference schedule before you finish out the uh, write-off? Tristan, I'll start with you. Yeah, it, it's happening for a number of conferences. The Big Ten's been doing it for a few years. You know, a lot of these conferences are going to 20 games now. Uh, Horizon League is unique because they're going 22 for a complete round robin. You know, the goal is to get as many games in as possible. And for a team like, the, for a conference like the Horizon League, who isn't one of the lower to automatic one bit majors, but isn't on the same level as the A10 or WCC, I think having as many conference games as possible instead of the just having a whole bunch of buy games that's not going to do anything good for your resume, you might as well have these competitive games ready now. That way, you'll really be good to go in January, which is what's going to matter for all of these teams, whether they have a shot in that large bid or not. Mm -hmm. I think they lucked out with the two first teams they're going to face off against because traveling to Green Bay and Milwaukee right away is probably going to help them in the long run because that is the toughest trip they would take all season long is when you go up to that, you know, Wisconsin and, um, you know, northern part of the trip, which is good for them. Like we saw teams in the past, other teams on campus who go up there, and then they lose all the wind out of their cells. They didn't get, they didn't go to these two schools last year. They didn't, no team at RMU actually played Green Bay last year, or except for softball. But it's it's a good trip for them to get out of right of the way, right out of the way, and then they go back into non-conference. So it's sort of like a, I guess a st stagnated, or not a stagnated, but a, I don't know what word I'm trying to use there, but a um, one that you can use to sort of stop and start as a way to gauge how good you are, and then you get back into non-conference, so you don't got to worry. The games don't matter for the conference schedule at least and then you move on and get back into the Horizon League play. So it's important. If, if I'm not mistaken, uh, is it the first five games for Robert Morris all on the road in conference play? Um, starting off, yes, they are. Yeah. yeah, so I think this is the best case scenario mm -hmm. to get two of them on its own separately because going five straight back right. to back to back like that, it could really put them in a hole in the conference right. standings. So they definitely lucked out when he – in terms of how it, it was scheduled. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, definitely. So they got Green Bay on December 2nd, and then December 4th, nationally televised game on ESPNU. I guess Milwaukee, first taste of Patrick Baldwin Jr. Um, Tristan, I mean, I know Tyler and I have talked about it at nauseum, but, you know, what are your thoughts on Patrick Baldwin Jr. picking Milwaukee, playing with his dad? Um, and, you know, what does it mean for this conference? It, it's, it's huge news for the Horizon League in general. I mean, for uh, not, he's not just a five star, but a top ten to top five overall guy, a clear cut one and done, a six eight versatile forward. He's probably going to play point, which is probably why Tijon Lucas transferred out. He's he's going to be an absolute star, not necessarily on the same level as Kate Cunningham with the height, but he's going to put up absolute numbers. A phenomenal guy, and not just him, but DeAndre Jol uh, Golston coming back too. You know, there are some people who think that Milwaukee could win the Horizon League if the supporting cast does well. And I think so too, which is probably a good thing for Robert Morris that they're getting him early on in league play before because he's going to be a freshman. He's not going to be experienced to what how intense conference battles are. So he'll get through his regular schedule, and this could be a chance for Robert Morris to, to sneak one in and really put themselves on the map when it comes to beating one of the projected top five teams. Yeah, I mean, I think like definitely when you see – you know, a guy like Patrick Baldwin Jr., you know, enter the school, you're like, oh, yeah, clear cut, you know, oh, they're going to win the Horizon League, all of that. I mean, yeah, I do see that, you know, with this, this is a key piece for them. I mean, especially Golston returning uh, back to this team. They're going to be a very tough team to beat in the uh, Horizon League coming up this year. Um, and, yeah, like we said, they get those two road games out of the way in conference play, then right back home against Lancaster Bible College on December 8th. Um, and then Florida Gulf Coast to end their home slate for the non-conference games. Florida Gulf Coast is another uh, game, you know, where I look at, you know, it's a good check-in point for them, especially after their first two conference games on the schedule. This is a, this is a, this is a game that they should probably win, especially at home. Um, and you know, I mean, this is probably, a, you know, moving on to you know the final couple games. This is a game where you know, once again, check in and see, you know, where's this team at? Are they, you know? 
starting to turn that corner if they were to struggle early on in this um, in the in the season. So I mean, Blake has survival. We know that. I mean, it's probably going to be a win for Robert Morris. This is a team that they should. Uh, eas- easily be being a uh, D3 school in Lancaster Bible. But, I mean, what are your guys' thoughts on Florida Go- that Florida Gulf Coast game? So that's going to be good. That's actually two programs that had their signature moments in the same year. Um, but it's a team that RMU has played in the past and beat in the past So I th- and went down there and beat them, I believe. Um, so that's, that's, again, a good non-conference game for them to have as they transition into Horizon League right after that. Uh, Lancaster Bible, again, is the one game a year where they get, where they, you know, hope they, that you hope they win. Like last year, it was Point Park. This year, it's not as local, but it's the same state college in Lancaster Bible, and we'll see how they do against that one. Because that's one where you can start to get, if if it gets out of hand, you can get some of the guys that don't play too much in, you know, and see how they are prepared. But I think having Bowling Green right after Florida Gulf Coast is going to be tough for them. That's a team that's handled them in the past. Yeah, Lancaster Bible, when you schedule teams like that in the middle of non-conference, they're usually the get-right games or the confidence boosters. You know, they're, they're going to take their lumps going up against Kentucky, UCF, Davidson, and them. So that's going to be a nice uh, com- confidence booster for them. Florida Gulf Coast is interesting. They're a projected bottom-tier team in the, in the A-Sun. They lost a lot of talent. But they did bring in Kevin Samuel, who was an all-conference defensive player at TCU, averaged nearly a double-double. He was definitely a good enough player to power conference level. So for him to go to Florida Gulf Coast was a pretty big surprise. He was already named preseason defensive player of the year. So that game itself was going to be a really good test for this newly revamped front court for Robert Morris. If Samuel has his way, then then you might be concerned about what this team does. But I think the depth and the different lineups that you can throw at him, especially with guys who can space the floor and take them uh, away from the basket, it's going to be a really good opportunity to see which of these bigs Robert Morris wants to use going forward against Mm -hmm. them. And then, yeah, like uh, Tyler said, right after Florida Gulf Coast is Bowling Green, they lost um, at home against Bowling Green last year pretty easily. I think it was by like 18 or 20 points. So a game, you know, once again, I mean, with the, with the guys that have returned or the, the guys that came in for Robert Morris, this is a game where, you know, last year I don't think it's going to be necessarily the case for them. I think this is a game where, you know, it's kind of going to be a toss-up game. They could win this game if they, if they play very well and, you know, are able to, you know, put up, Put up uh, good, or have good production. That's what I was going for. Um, good production against um, the Falcons, but you know another one of those games where you know heading into um, conf- the conference schedule, this is a good game where you know this is this is going to be some very good competition uh, that Robert Morris is going to go up against. Um, and then they got St. Francis, another old NEC school, going up against them on December 22nd. And then conference play starts once again, kicks back off. On December 30th in Oakland, um, so I mean that's that's another team where it's like like Tristan said earlier, the middle of the pack where you know it could go any any which way. So definitely one of those games where if you can get off on the right foot, especially starting up against conference play, if you split the first you know two games, this is a good game where you can get right get off on the right foot um, against them. Yeah, and I think uh, the game right after that is one where they're going to be looking for a little revenge on their own because they lost three straight times to Detroit last year, and they're looking to maybe make up for that and with, with a new roster and a team that maybe is actually prepared for those games as opposed to last year where they were just thrown right into the fray, immediately played them on the road twice and then and again on the road. Um, yeah, obviously Antoine Davis is going to be tough to handle, but you know they actually know how he plays this year. They have some film on him. And like I said, Andy Tool now has film on pretty much everyone in the conference, so they'll be better prepared than they were last year for some of these closer games. Yeah, th- this is. I think this is where we're going to see the impact of Rasheem Dunn felt the most. And he's a solid offensive player, a capable point guard, but he's a really good defender. And I think he's going to be tasked to go up against Jalen Moore, a star guard for Oakland, who's probably going to play all 40 minutes a game again. And then Antoine Davis, you're not going to stop him, but can you at least get, have him do an inefficient 25 points a game? That's mm-hmm. usually how teams beat Detroit is. Let him have his and then stop everyone else. I think Robert Morris is going to hope to have a defensive stopper on in backcourt this year, and I think Dumb's capable of that. But he's but then it's also on the offensive end you're going to need Michael Green and Flavors and Ferris to step up offensively because it's going to be really draining going up against some of these guards in the Horizon League all 40 minutes. Mm-hmm. Oh, definitely, definitely. And you know Antoine Davis, you know the way that he plays. I mean he's he's average I think like 26 points per game in his whole career. So it's definitely going to be a tough guy for them to stop. Um, and then, I mean, right after that, 
They have five straight home games against Youngstown State, Cleveland State, Purdue Fort Wayne, Wright State, and Northern Kentucky. So those are five games where it's some home cooking, um, especially starting right off early and her- and horizonly play games where you know you're at home, you have the home crowd with you, and you know if you did struggle on that on that road trip, this is a game where you can get right and get back and get on track. Especially, I mean, not many times during a season are you going to get five straight home games. So this is definitely a series where you got to take a good amount of these games. Um, so it's going to be very um, key for them to, you know, have success um, on this homestand. Uh, right, and I wouldn't say it's going to make or break their schedule because they got plenty of games left after that, but I think it's one that's going to be perfect for them and those five straight home games, especially starting off with Youngstown State, a team that kind of victimized them last year, you know. They don't have Darius Quisenberry anymore who really put up two great performances against them last season. But it's a team that they definitely need to handle and make up for lost time because they lost back-to-back overtime games against them, two heartbreakers. Um, and then, you know, you got Purdue-Fort Wayne and you got Cleveland State. And then that Cleveland State game is going to be really important for them. Now, they got two Cleveland State games in the span of, I think, two or three weeks. So, um, that, and the team that won the conference last year, they never got to face off against them. So they can finally, you know, see how they play. But they played them in the past and they played them well in the past. Yeah, I mean – you could argue that they're going to go up against the top three teams in the Horizon League during this stretch. Mm-hmm. And it's going to be a tough task to beat Cleveland State or Wright State, home, way, or neutral. But these are the games, especially as Tyler talked about, Robert Morris didn't even play the top teams mm-hmm. in the unbalanced schedule last year. So having a much better roster compared to what they did a year ago, it should put them in an opportunity. These are games that if you want to finish in the top six seven understandings, these you have to sneak one of those wins. Mm-hmm. You, you have to beat Youngstown State. That's an absolute must on this stretch. Uh, Purdue-Fort Wayne, same thing, cons- considering who else you have. And if you can just sneak one of those three, Wright State, Northern Kentucky, or Cleveland State, then you would feel really good about this stretch. Anything worse than three or two, and you could be staring at a bottom four finish in the conference. Mm-hmm. Definitely, definitely. And, you know, like Tyler stated, uh, Purdue, Fort Wayne, and Cleveland State right after that. And then they're back home against Milwaukee. And then they played Green Bay once again at home on January 29th. And we're in, already into February. Uh, they got UIC and IUPUI, two teams that they should they, they should be able to beat on the road. I know they've had some troubles with UIC in the past, losing both games last year and then a game the year before. Um, but, you know, definitely a UIC team that's hurting now after, you know, Rob Howard is – is gone and some other guys that they did lose from their team last year that they had a lot of success with. Um, so definitely a team there that uh, that they could definitely win a game there in Chicago. And then obviously IUPUI today with the news with Zach Gunn out for the year. They were already hurting for guys um, being ranked you know last in the preseason poll with a new head coach on the way as well. Um, losing him as well, it's definitely a bigger loss for them. Um, so definitely a game that Army should win in February against the Jaguars. Yeah, and those are ones – that's the stretch where you're looking at where you're like, okay, you know, maybe if we went a little bit rough, we can finally, you know, get some wins under our belt. And um, UIC last year was really tough for them on the road especially, you know, and they, they got uh, crushed by another overtime loss in that series. You know, they had to – I believe they had to start a bunch of freshmen in that series as well because they were missing a couple of guys. So now that they have experienced guys go into these um, towns, go into these cities that they um, maybe you may not have played in, in the past, they can be better prepared for these two games, I think, be, than that stretch. And then they close it out with some a bit of a lighter schedule but also tougher, as you'll see Wright State and Cleveland State later in the season. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, and then after that, they got Detroit Mercy and Oakland at home, and then they go on the road for a quick uh, um, meeting with Youngstown State. Um, and then IUPUI and UIC again at home. So, yeah, like Tyler said, this is a stretch where you can win a lot of these games and, you know, see yourself moving up in the conference if they did struggle um, earlier on. And then finally, to close out the season, Northern Kentucky and Wright State, two of the top teams in the Horizon League. That's a that's a tough way to end the season, but, you know, a, a, a stretch where you need to take at least one of these games. Yeah, it was a bit of a top-heavy, you know, first half, like you said, with the five straight games against the tougher teams. But then you close it out with those two tough ones. It's going to be tough to gauge really what's going to happen in these games. Mm-hmm. And, you know, yeah, that's that's the schedule. I mean, so moving on, do we have any players to watch? I mean, Tristan, I'll start off with you. Who are you most looking forward to seeing this year? Definitely the backcourt tandem of Michael Green, Rasheem Dunn. There's a chance, you know, 
there's a lot of great individual guards, but Robert Morris has a chance to have one of the better backcourts. And it'll be interesting to see how the three-point shooting goes for Dunn and Green. Both of them are point guard, capable point guards, but their pass doesn't vote well when it comes to three-point shooting, which is great why you have uh, Flavors and Harris, but do you necessarily want to go three-guard offenses? And you might have to if those two starting guards aren't great shooters because you need somebody at the three spot that is a capable shooter as well, as well as what we're going to see from the front court. But I'm really interested to see what these guards do because this is still a guard-heavy conference. I'm excited to see what uh, Khalil Spear does this season after he has less of a burden placed on him to be you know, the guy after A.J. Brahma leaves. Um, cause he really stepped up and then, um, again, another returning guy in Cam Ferris, you know, shot at 47% from three last year, looked like he was just a dead eye from outside. So if he can continue that, it's going to be good. And then, you know, a new guy coming in, I've always said, Justin Winston's my guy that I'm going to be looking at and see how he handles from moving from the A10 over to here and see what, um, you know, we've been all hearing about him from practices and, you know, hitting from threes and stuff like that. So it's going to be interesting to see how he plays joining the squad. I mean, definitely the new guys that stick out to me is definitely Winston. Also Stone, I mean, being able to have that bigger bigger guy in your lineup is definitely going to benefit them after, you know, not being able to be the most uh, the most uh, tall team on the court. Um, you know, they've struggled with rebounding in the past, especially in that non-conference schedule. I um, mean, you know, definitely in the Horizon League last year. Uh, but how, being able to have that true center guy, I think that's going to be very key for them and definitely one that I'm going to be looking into as well. But definitely just, just the guys that are able to stretch the floor, some of the bigger guys like Winston, Matteo Kunzo as well, those guys that are able to stretch the floor and you know, you know, be able to space out this offense is definitely going to be something that I'm going to be looking out for. I mean, also, you know, Cam Ferris as well, guy that averaged eight and a half points last year had a significant role on the team, you know, seeing how he, you know, works together with, you know, Michael Green, Farron Flavors, and Rasheem Dunn, seeing how all of that works out with them, I think it's going to be very crucial for them this year and something that I'm going to be looking towards and looking forward towards as the season progresses. Well, Tristan, I mean, is there anything else you would like to add before we wrap up this episode? Yeah, I think it's important to keep in mind that this is a new level of rebuilding for the program. Going from the Northeast to the Horizon League is a genuinely big jump. And they took their lumps last year, rebuilt roster. They're going to take lumps this year, but it's more so have to do with the strength of the conference. I think if you take out the two juniors for Wright State who are stars, even after Loughton Love leaves, every all the other top players in this conference are either seniors or the freshmen uh, for Milwaukee. So there's a really good chance after this year, teams like Detroit, Milwaukee, Oakland are going to take big steps back. Cleveland State as well, especially if uh, head coach Dennis Gates becomes part of the coaching carousel and moves on as well when most of their team is fifth-year seniors themselves. You could really see Robert Morris in the future take a big jump to the top four or five. I think Coach Toole showed that he can uh, bring in transfers instead of losing them. And as he has, he had to deal with in the past. Horizon League is going to be a better destination for transfers. Uh, you only lose a, a, a few guys from this roster. Everyone else has the potential to come back. And if things look well, you can bring in even better players. The future is, is definitely going to look well for Robert Morris. He just have to get through what could be one of the better Horizon League seasons that we've seen in recent memory of so much senior-level talent. 